All right. Here's the biblical basis for apologetics. I have a lot to discuss. We're going to go end up in scripture as well. Let me show you where the Bible exhorts Christians to do apologetics. Are you ready? Are you ready for me to show you? Okay, let's line it up. Where does the scriptures teach to do apologetics? Here it is. The most famous passage that's cited by everyone and his grandmother. 1 Peter 3.15. 1 Peter 3.15. Okay, here you go. 1 Peter 3.15. Now, if you read the Greek, the Greek, this is what it's going to say. And you can find the Greek on BibleHub.com interlinear. But I'm going to tell you what it says by reading First English. 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense. There it is. You know what the word defense is in Greek? But always be ready and always be ready to give a defense to everyone ask you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You know what the word defense is in Greek? Okay. You Greek readers, you can confirm this. Apologian. 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 It's in the accusative. Apologian. That's where you get the word apologetics, apologist. The very word apologetics, apologist, that word from which we get apologetics, apologist, is found in the Greek New Testament. It's used in the Greek New Testament by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It is an inspired word, inspired by the Spirit through the human authors to use. So here what Peter is saying, let me break it down. Let me break it down what he's saying. He's mentioning this in the context of persecution. He's mentioning this in the context of suffering for your Christian faith. That here, Jews and Gentiles are being persecuted, beaten, killed, and imprisoned for their faith in Jesus Christ. So what Peter is telling Christians, not just elders, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he's exhorting believers. He's saying, set apart the Lord God in your hearts. Now what he means here is make sure you're resolute, right? Be resolute, stern. And have no doubt about your conviction that Jesus Christ is Lord. So put it in your heart, in your mind, and have absolutely no doubt, be, but be absolutely resolute in your conviction that Jesus is Lord, no matter what they do to you. Right? Don't be double-minded. Right? Don't be tossed with every... Wind and wave of doubt and fear, right? But resolve it within yourself and have no doubt within yourself that Jesus is Lord, he is real, and he's worthy that you suffer for him. And then if they ask you, why are you so resolute? Why are you so stern, immovable in your conviction that Jesus is Lord? Why Jesus? Why are you willing to die for Jesus, be imprisoned for Jesus, and kill for Jesus? What makes you so stern and immovable in your conviction that he is Lord? Give them the reason. Give them the answer. That's the meaning of the passage, right? But me, be meek about it, not arrogant about it, and do it out of reverence for God. Okay? But here's the problem, folks. You cannot defend a faith you don't know. So help me to help you stay focused on the class. Let the Spirit come forward and teach. You cannot defend a faith you don't know. So if you don't know the faith, how are you going to defend it? And then when the unbelievers question you, they're going to think that you're just blind and stupid because you're making a profession in someone that you don't even know why you believe in him. Are you with me there? So this assumes you know your faith, are convinced of your faith, 
understand your faith and living it out as a demonstration of, of your love for the Lord who revealed that faith. So you with me there? This is what this presupposes. Peter is assuming you know why you believe what you believe. You know why you believe Jesus is Lord and why you've chosen Christianity and not, let's say, Judaism or Zoroastrianism or Buddhism or Taoism. Everyone with me there? Okay, so the word for defense is apologian, apologian, which is the accusative form of apologia. Apologia is the word from which we get apologetics, apologists. So if I were to sum up what Peter is saying by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit is inspiring Peter saying, all of you, this is an exhortation to every member of the body of Christ, not just elders. Elders obviously must do this or they're not qualified to be leaders. But every Spirit-filled, born-again believer who's united to Christ through their baptism must be ready to do apologetics. That's what Peter is saying. And it's not a suggestion. It's a command. You with me there? Focus, Lightfoot. Be careful when you say no other religion offers salvation because Islam has a satanic corruption of the salvation offered in Christ. Now let me give you other places where the word apologia is used. So now if someone says apologetics, is it biblical? Yes, even the word from which we get apologetics is used in the Greek New Testament by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So who inspired Peter to use this word? The Holy Spirit. Now here are some other places where the word is used. Here it is. Philipp Philippians 1.7. Paul is writing this from prison. This is one of his prison epistles. So here it goes. Philippians 1.7. Paul in prison. It's one of his prison epistles written by inspiration. Focus. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart. Now watch. Light foot. Pay attention, everyone. Learn. Learn with me. Let the Spirit teach. Inasmuch as both in my chains... And in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. Did you catch it? Why am I in prison? Why am I being persecuted? Why am I being attacked, tortured? Because of my defending and confirming the gospel. Guess what the word defense is? The word defense is apologia, apologian. You with me there? If you look at the Greek, Peter and Paul both use the word apologia. So Paul is saying, I'm in prison for being an apologist for Jesus Christ to confirm the gospel. Focus, guys. Don't let the demons distract you. So here's another passage where an inspired author, inspired by the Spirit, is telling you up front, they threw me in prison for being an apologist sent to confirm the gospel. I'm an apologist who confirms the gospel. So don't let anyone lie to you and tell you apologetics is not biblical. Tell them what Bible are you reading. Now watch Philippians 1.16. Now, let me give you the background of this, because if you read the context, the context here would be Philippians 1, 12 to 18. Now, I can't give you all the context, but let me give you what the context is. Focus, help me to help you. Focus, baller, I'll give you the link to come on my stream yard. Don't be a distraction. I'm going to insult Muhammad. Okay, Philippians 1, 12 to 18 for the context, but... I'm just going to give you Philippians 1.16. Let's read it. You guys ready? Help me help you guys. Focus. Don't let the demons distract you. Okay. The former preached Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add afflictions to my chains. Sorry about that. Hold on. 
one second. One second. It is an interesting feature that New King James, King James, they have a different versification here, which is quite interesting. But anyway, Philippians 1, 16 to 17. Philippians 1, 16 to 17. Watch here. Read with me, guys. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love. Two groups. One preach the gospel out of love for Jesus and me, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. Can anyone tell me what the word defense is? I've been appointed by Jesus Christ for the defense of the gospel. Anyone have an idea what the word is? Anybody? It's apologia. So here Paul is saying, I have been appointed. The triune God appointed me. Father, Son, Holy Spirit appointed me to be an apologist defending the gospel, to do apologetics. Now, what's the context of this statement? In all these verses, the word is apologia, from which we get apologetics, apologist. Now, what's the context of this particular passage? Philippians 1, 12 to 18. The passage is referring to two groups of people who are preaching the gospel for two different reasons. Okay, guys, I need you to listen. Class has begun. Let the Spirit teach. Do not entertain trolls and be distracted. Because if you're distracted, you'll distract me and you won't be listening. And if you're not listening, you're not going to learn. I want you to learn. That's why I'm doing it. I want you to learn these facts for yourselves. Even if you already know them. Okay. He's saying there's a group that envies me and hates me. And delights that I'm suffering. And so when they preach the gospel, they're not doing it with good intentions. They're doing it to spite me and add to my misery. But then there's another group that love me and believe that Christ has appointed me. And they're preaching the gospel out of their love for Christ and me. And my imprisonment is encouraging them and emboldening them emboldening them to not be afraid to suffer for Christ. In other words, this group that loves him is looking to Paul saying, well, if Paul can do it, if the same spirit in Paul can enable him to suffer for Christ, that same spirit can enable me to suffer for Christ. Why am I afraid? So you with me there? So two different groups preaching the gospel for two different reasons. One hate Paul envy Paul and do it to spite Paul, to challenge Paul, right? And to add to his misery and pain and affliction. Another group loves Paul because they know he's a servant of the Lord and they've been encouraged and emboldened by his willingness to suffer, to also preach and suffer the consequences. In other words, they're looking at Paul saying, man, I got the same spirit filling me that's filling him. So if the spirit is mighty in him, enabling him to suffer for Christ, then the Spirit will also enable me, so why am I afraid? So understand what Paul is saying? Two different groups, right? Notice what Philippians 1.16 says about the group that does it out of hate for him. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition. Not sincerely. They're doing it for filthy lucre, for status, position, and they hate me and envy me because they want to get the attention for themselves. Supposing to add affliction to my chains. But you know what's beautiful about Paul? Filled with the Spirit of Christ. A holy example for us to follow. Because he says, emulate me as I emulate Christ. You know what he says about both groups? And he don't distract us, focus on the topic. He says, no matter what the motivation, even this group that's doing it out of envy and hatred for me, it doesn't matter that's their motive. It doesn't matter that's their motive because even though their motive is wicked, they're still preaching the gospel and getting thousands saved. And for that, I rejoice because God will then deal with them on the day of judgment and punish them for their wicked, selfish motives. 
Until then, I want them to continue to preach. I want them to think by preaching, they're offending me, hurting me, afflicting me, because little do they realize that though their motive is evil and satanic at its core, they're reaching more people with the same gospel and getting more people saved by the Spirit in spite of their wicked motives. So for that, I thank the Lord. Because I don't care if they hate me. I don't care if they do it out of selfish ambition to make me miserable. As long as they're doing it and people are getting saved, glory to God, more people come to know Jesus, fall in love with Him, and the Lord will deal with them on the day of judgment. So let Him continue. You get it? Let, uh, let them continue. Let them hate me. Who cares? It's not about me. It's about Jesus. May Jesus increase and I decrease. It's not about me, whether you like me, whether you love me, whether you support me. I'm insignificant. I'm a vapor. Here today, gone tomorrow. I don't care if you hate me. I don't care if you don't like me. Preach the gospel. Let get, people get saved. So they can be spared from the day of wrath. And God will deal with you on the day of judgment. That's all that matters to me. May we all be like Paul in his love for Jesus. And not love for himself. Focus, right? That's why Paul is my hero. Okay. Now, here are cases of apologetics in action. Are we ready? Let's now see the apostles and their followers actually doing apologetics. The book of Acts is filled with examples of the apostles and their followers doing apologetics in the power of the Holy Spirit. Acts 17, verses 2 to 3. But we're going to read verses 1 to 4. Acts 17, verses 2 to 3, but we're going to read 1 to 4 for context. Here it is. Follow with me, brethren. Okay? Follow with me. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, pay attention, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, note, this was something he did. This was his custom, his habitual practice, that whatever place he went to, he would find a synagogue. And on the Sabbath, he'd go to the synagogue and preach. Went into them. And for three Sabbaths, for three weeks, what did he do? Pay attention. What did he do? Reasoned with them from the scriptures. Reasoned with them from the scripture. Now, at this time, there was no New Testament. He was going into synagogues, opening up the scrolls of the Hebrew Bible to prove the gospel from the Hebrew Bible. Reasoning with them. That's what apologetics is. Explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. Now watch the result. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, because many Greeks became God-fearers in that they abandoned the worship of the gods and goddesses and started worshiping the God of Israel. So the acts are called God-fearing Gentiles or Greeks. And not a few of the leading women. Join Paul and Silas. You see the result? Focus now. What was Paul's custom? Okay. What did Paul do? Now, if you didn't know the first century setting, it would be customary of synagogues to allow teachers, right? Rabbis to come in and read from the scroll, and then expound on it. So do we get the point of Acts 17, 1 of 4? What was Paul's custom? His custom was to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath because it was the tradition, the tradition to allow rabbis to expound the scriptures on the Sabbath. So Paul took advantage of it. He would go there and he would take the scroll and expound on the scripture. But he used that to show from the scripture, notice verse 2, then Paul, as his custom was, went into them 
And for three Sabbaths, reason with them from the scriptures. Doing what? Showing all the places in the Hebrew Bible. There was no New Testament at this time. Where the prophet said the Messiah, Christ, had to suffer and die and rise from the dead. And then proving this Jesus who was recently killed, he is that Messiah who perfectly fulfilled the prophets that said Messiah would be killed and be raised. And he is alive and I've seen him. We got it now? Okay. Now, we have the very scriptures Paul had. And now we have the New Testament, 14 books of which were written by Paul, by the Holy Spirit, or dictated by Paul to Amuenesis, Amuensis, Amuensis. That's a fancy technical term meaning scribes by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So now we have the full canon and we have the history of the church to fully equip us to do what Paul does. But the question is, can we, can we do what Paul did? Can we do what Paul did? Go to the local synagogues and challenge your rabbis to open up the Hebrew Bible and prove to them exegetically, contextually, grammatically, beyond any reasonable doubt, Messiah would first be killed and be raised from the dead before he reigns in glory like Paul. But everyone get it? Get it, soon. Good to see you, sister. Everyone seeing the biblical basis, the biblical foundation for polemics, apologetics. So, okay. Did you see the word for apologetics, apologist, found in the Greek New Testament? Apologia. 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 1 Peter 3.15. Philippians 1.17. I'm sorry. Philippians 1.7. Philippians 1.16. But different Bibles have different versifications. So you may have to look at Philippians 1.17. Do you now see examples of them doing apologetics? Acts 17, verses 1 to 4. Acts 17, 1 to 4. It was the custom of the Spirit-filled apostles and their companions to prove beyond any reasonable doubt the truth of Christianity. Now let me give you one example where the Holy Spirit even praises a man eloquent and mighty in the Old Testament for publicly debating Jews and silencing them. Are you ready for my final example? Acts 18, 24 to 28. My final example of many. I could give you a lot more. My final example of many. Help me to help you. Let's make this a blessed session as we enter into the Lord's Day Sunday. Some of you are already in Sunday. So we can go to church and take the Holy Eucharist by the grace of the Holy Spirit for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's make the most of tonight. Acts 18, 24, 28. This passage, inspired by the Spirit through Luke, shows you the Spirit praising a man whom he equipped to be quite eloquent, meaning a very articulate communicator whose knowledge of the Old Testament was phenomenal and who helped Christians by publicly refuting the Jews like Tovia Singer, praised by the Holy Spirit through Luke, his human instrument. Here it is, Acts 18, 24 to 28. Read with me. Acts 18, 24 to 28. Now, a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria. Alexandria, Egypt, meaning he's an African Jew. Well, you know what? Let me be careful on saying he's an African Jew. At least he's from Alexandria, Egypt. And by the way, Egypt is Africa. It's not Arabia. An eloquent man. Now, remember, if you believe Luke is writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's the Spirit moving Luke to say, that Apollos was an eloquent man, a very eloquent speaker, and mighty in the scriptures, meaning his knowledge of the Old Testament was superb. And he came to Ephesus, which is in Asia Minor, Turkey. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, right? Instructed in the way of the Lord, so he was taught about the Lord. Now watch here. And being fervent in spirit, he was zealous for the Lord and the things of the Lord. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he only knew, he knew only the baptism of John. Now, that can mean one of two things. 
That can mean one of two things. Now pay attention, guys. This is meat from the spirit for us to learn our faith. Okay. It can mean he only knew about one type of baptism. John's baptism. Christopher, if I have to explain again what fervent in the spirit is, I'm going to have Butch cuss you out in Jilu. I'm going to have him swear at you in Jilu. I just told you, fervent meaning he's passionate and zealous. All right. Go to dictionary.com. It can mean he wasn't aware of believer's baptism, that there was a baptism enjoined by our Lord that was different from John's baptism. He didn't know about that. So he wasn't baptized with the baptism enjoined by the Lord, which was separate from John's baptism, the water baptism, which gives you the grace of the Spirit to make you alive and unite you to Christ. Or it can mean the only thing he knew about the Lord was that John baptized him, and the Lord was killed, crucified, raised, and ascended to heaven, but he didn't know much about Jesus' earthly ministry. Okay, you with me there? Everyone with me there? Now let me know if you're benefiting from this, because I'm doing a classes to be used of the Spirit to benefit you. Okay? Either way, notice what the Spirit is teaching us through His example. Either way, notice what the Spirit is teaching us through His example. Watch what the Spirit is teaching us. If you're not paying attention, I can't help you. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Boldly now. Boldly, not timidly. Now watch. A husband and wife team. When Aquila and Priscilla, husband and wife, heard him, who were companions of Paul, Aquila and Pr heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. There you go. Here's what you're learning from the Holy Spirit. You need to have people mature in the faith to disciple you. It is not enough to lead someone to Christ. You must then disciple them in the way of the Lord. So when Aquila and Priscilla heard this man and saw this man and saw how passionate he was with the little knowledge he had, then they took him under their wing, taught him the faith from A to Z, a to Z, right? And then sent him out. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, well, listen to this, the brethren wrote, exhorting, now a certain Jew named Apollos, now, a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. Number one, the Holy Spirit had gifted him to be a clear, articulate communicator, eloquent. It's the Spirit inspiring Luke to give him this praise. If you believe scripture is inspired by the Spirit and mighty in the scriptures. What does that mean? He was knowledgeable in the Hebrew Bible. This is the point I didn't hear you guys mention. Listen and meditate and learn by the power of the Spirit. Don't drop the ball. You're wasting my time and disrespecting the session. I don't need to be teaching. I can go do something else if the Lord wants me to do something else. You're here because you want to learn. Pay attention. These are the qualities that the Spirit praises. These are admirable qualities if they weren't, the Spirit wouldn't have Luke highlighting them. So do you want to make the Spirit happy and delight in you? Then here are the qualities the Spirit is highlighting and praising. Eloquent and quite knowledgeable in the Bible. You see what you guys are not getting? And I can't be loud. My neighbors are asleep. Come on, guys. If there's something the scriptures praise, that means God is praising those qualities and God is highlighting those qualities for you to then 
emulate and cultivate them in yourself. Are you getting it? Are we getting it? Pramulan? The things in scripture are there for reason, for our edification. So note, what does the Bible praise? That's what God wants in you. So if the Spirit inspired Luke to highlight he was eloquent, God wants you to be eloquent. And you can because you have the same Spirit filling you that filled them. And he was mighty in the Scriptures. God wants you to be mighty in the Scriptures. But he didn't know enough about the historical Jesus. And so then the second thing the Lord is highlighting for you and me, okay, this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. The second thing God wants you to note, you guys want me to go and meet? May the numbers increase tonight for the glory of Christ. Do you want to know the second thing that God wants you to see and learn and emulate and cultivate? Make sure you are teaching accurately about Jesus. Why do you think I get on your case and I lose my testimony and I yell at you and I shut down sessions or block you when you're not paying attention? Because what is my mantra? Make sure you understood what you hear see and read correctly, lest you then miscommunicate and be held accountable. Are you catching it here? So the second, second thing the Lord wants you to do, only teach those things about the Lord that you know you've understood correctly. The areas you do not know Shut your mouth until you learn them. 